In this video, we're gonna build out this complete 204080 clone. And this is a great intermediate level project because it involves some fairly complex logic and also handles things such as CSS animations in JavaScript, classes in JavaScript, and so much more. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And here on the right, you can see the final working version of our game. As you can see, it works just like normal 2048 and has a lot of really cool animations to make it look even better. Also, I have a full version of this game at 2048daily.com. You can check out, it has like how to play instructions. It has some even more animations, some scorekeeping. It has some stats so you can share it with other people. So I highly recommend you checking this out because this is even more fully fledged version of the game we're going to create in this video. So to create this though, let's get started. We first need to create our index.html. So let's create an index.html file. And also I'm gonna create a styles.css and a script.js file, just our basic files that we're going to need to work to create this project. And the main thing about this project we need to focus on is going to be the HTML first, then the CSS, and then the JavaScript. I find doing it like that is the easiest way for me to develop a project like this. So let's just get our boilerplate HTML going. And inside of here, we really only have one thing, which is our game board. And our game board is going to have our cells inside of it, these like gray scores that you see. And it's also going to have tiles, which are the things that have numbers on them. So this is a four by four grid. So let's just come in here and create some cells. So there's four of them. We'll just copy that down. So eight, 12, and 16. There's all the cells that we need. And right there is pretty much all of our boilerplate HTML. Now to move on to our style sheets, let's just link it. So we'll come in here and we're gonna link our styles.css. And the very first thing I wanna do is I just wanna come in here and get on my before and after elements. There we go. I just wanna set the box sizing to border box. Also, I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually going to change my font family to be Arial just because it looks a little bit better than the default font. Now, the very first thing I want to do is focus on getting our grid set up and getting our background set up how we want it to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here. I'm going to select that game board. And what I want to do is I want to change the display of this to be grid because we're going to use grid to display this and we're going to have our template columns and rows. So let's say template rows here. We're just going to have this repeat. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a repeat four times and we're going to give it a specific size. In our case, let's just say 20 V min is the size of this. And we're gonna copy this again because we're gonna do our grid template columns. And our grid template columns are exactly the same as our grid template rows. So now if we just come in here and we just say that we want the background color of this to be CCC, we should hopefully be able to see something when we open this up with live server. So we'll just open this up real quick. I'll drag this over and as you can see, we kind of get this rectangle showing up on our screen. And we take our body and we change the background color of that to be 333. Now you can see we have that gray kind of area and that looks very similar to the gray area that we have here. The next step is to make it so the cells have a darker gray color. So we can select our cells and we can give them a different background color. In our case, we're just gonna set this background color to AAA. And if we save and come over here, you'll notice not too much is different. We kind of have this AAA section over here and then we have that lighter color section on the right hand side. We can also give them a border radius. So we can say our border radius is one V min. Now you can kind of see we have these sections showing up, but there's no space between them. So what we want to do is add in a gap. So we can say that our gap here is going to be two V min, for example. Now we have two V min between each one of these elements. And the reason I'm using V min for all of my sizings is so that way, no matter what size our browser is, this window is going to scale. As you can see, this is increasing and decreasing in size based on our browser size. So it doesn't matter how big or small our browser is, whether on our phone or on a desktop, it's always going to give us a really good looking game. Now, the next thing we need to do is make this game board look a little bit better and see that we're actually gonna style our body a little bit more. So what I wanna do is I wanna center everything. So I'll use display flex, justify the content in the center and align the items in the center. And then if I set a height here to our page of 100 VH, what that's going to do is it's going to make sure that our page is 100 VH tall. Without that, you can see it's positioned at the top, but with that, you can see it's now dead center. And what I can do is I can just say, hey, our margin is going to be zero, get rid of the scrolling on our page, and that looks really good. And then finally, what I wanna do is I wanna set an overall font size of 7.5 V min. Again, this is going to scale with our page, so the text inside of each of these squares is going to scale as our page size changes. Now we have our board centered. Let's make it look just a little bit better. We can add a border radius to the outside of 1 V min. And also we can add a padding, which in our case is gonna be 2 V min. And then finally, I'm gonna add a position relative. The reason for that position relative is because each one of these tiles, you can see that as we move them, they slide that nice sliding animation. And that sliding animation is done by making the tiles position absolute and then relatively position them wherever we want to inside of this grid. So we have our grid essentially completely done. 
our border radius is not there. I need to make sure I add that in. There we go, now we have our border radius. So our entire grid is completely done. All that's left is like the tiles section. But one thing you'll notice is we have a lot of repeated values. This 20v min is repeated, this four is repeated, this 2v min is repeated. I wanna extract those out into CSS variables. So what we can do is we can say, hey, our grid size is going to be four. We're gonna copy this down. We're gonna have our cell size next. And our cell size is just that 20v min. So I'm gonna copy that in. And then finally, we're going to have our cell gap. And this is the space between all of our cells. So what we can do is we can replace this 20v min with our cell size variable. We can place this four right here with a variable for our grid size. I'm just gonna copy this entire value, paste it down here. So now when I save, nothing changes, but the nice thing is all these variables we can use in other places. Same thing down here, we have two v min. I wanna replace both of those with our cell gap. And there we go, nothing changes, but now again, we have these inside of variables, so we can make them and use them inside of our tile class as well, which is exactly what I'm gonna work on next. So what I wanna do is I wanna go inside my index.html, and in here, I'm just gonna add in a tile, and we're gonna put like the value two in it, for example. So what we wanna do is we wanna make this position absolute first, so it doesn't mess with any of the rest of our grid. There we go, that's exactly what we want. And now what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that it's going to also center our text, so we're gonna say display as flex, justify content center, and align items in the center. And if we give this a specific width and height, which is our just cell size, which we created a variable for, when you just get our height down there, you'll see that now this is going to be centered. The text is centered inside that cell. And if we just give it a temporary background color of red, you can kind of see what we're working with. We have that red section right there. Also, I want to come in here with our border radius. Our border radius is going to be one V min, just so it's rounded just like our cell. And now what I wanna do is figure out how we can position this in the correct location. Because essentially, I just wanna take our tile, I wanna give it an X, and I wanna give it a Y position. For example, let's just say two and one. I wanna give it an X of one, a Y of two, and it's going to position itself in that location. So it would be in the X, Y location of one and two. So we're gonna use some CSS math to do that. We wanna take the top position, and we wanna get a calculation. And inside of here, hey, I wanna take that X variable that we have, and what I wanna do is I wanna multiply that by essentially some addition. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take our cell size. So right here, we're taking our X position, multiplying it by our cell size. So far, that is really good, but we also need to take into account the gaps that we have between our cells and between the wall. So what we can do is we can just add in a variable for our cell gap. And now if we save this, and make sure we do this also for our left direction, which is gonna be here, our X, and up here we have Y, so our left is X, and our top is Y. If we save, you'll notice it's really close. It's off by one cell gap, and that's because we have this gap around the entire outside of our perimeter as well that we need to take into account. So I wanna just add in one more cell gap onto the end of this, and now if I save, you'll notice that cell is in the exact right position. If I give it a X of zero and a Y of zero, you can see it's in the top left. And as we move X, it's moving, or as we change our Y, it's moving down in the grid, which looks really good. And as we change our X, it's moving across in the grid. So now we can just give it an X and a Y position, and it's gonna put itself exactly where it needs to inside of that grid. And the whole reason this works is this simple calculation right here, which is just saying, hey, take the cell size and the cell gap, multiply by our position, and then just make sure we include this border as well by adding that in at the very end. Now, there's only a few other things that I wanna do to this cell to make it exactly like I want. I wanna take the font weight, and I just wanna bold it so that our text is a little bit bigger. And also inside of here, what I wanna do is I wanna change around our background color and our color. So we're gonna say our background color, and we're gonna come down here, and we're gonna do our color as well. And our background color, we're gonna calculate from a variable. So the way 2048 works, as you can see, everything is a power of two. So we have two, four, eight, 16, 32, and so on. So everything is a power of two. What I wanna do is as our number increases, so my power of two increases, I wanna make the background color darker. And our foreground color, the actual color itself, is also going to change related to that background color. And this is mostly going to be happening in JavaScript. So what I wanna do for now is just kinda of set up my background color. So I'm gonna say it's gonna be an HSL, where we're gonna have our color be 200, our hue, we're gonna have 50% for our saturation, and then our lightness is going to be coming from our JavaScript. So I'm gonna just call this background lightness. I wanna do essentially the exact same thing with our color, except for I wanna change our saturation here to 25%, so it's a little bit desaturated, and I also wanna change this to be our text lightness. So if we just give these some placeholder values where we say like background lightness, and we set that to let's say 
and we come in here with our text lightness and we set that to, for example, 80%, you can see we get this kind of style thing. Or if we swap them, you know, like 20, 80, we would get a tile that looks kind of like this, pretty similar to what we have over here. And that is all going to be set in the JavaScript. So the nice thing is this X, Y, background lightness and text lightness, all we need to do is set these in our JavaScript and it's essentially going to position our tile exactly where we want it to be. So we can get rid of these and inside of our index here, we can get rid of our tile. And now we're essentially ready to move on to our JavaScript. So I wanna come in here, I wanna get a script tag that is going to point to that script file. And I'm going to actually set the type here equal to module. And that's because we're going to be using modules in JavaScript. If you're unfamiliar with modules, I have a full video kind of covering them. I'll link it in the cards and description for you. Now, actually real quick, right before we move over to our JavaScript, I'm gonna add that tile back in like this. And there's one thing I wanna to add to our tile and that is going to be a simple animation. So I wanna give it a show animation, which lasts 200 milliseconds. I'm gonna say ease in, ease out. And the show animation is just going to be a simple animation where the thing becomes more opaque on our screen. So we're gonna set our 0% keyframe here to have an opacity of 0.5. And we're gonna set our transform here to be a scale of zero. So now when I save, you can see that that tile, if I give it like a number instead of it, when I save and refresh my page, the tile kind of grows and fades into existence. So instead of just appearing, it's kind of fading and growing into existence. It looks a little bit better in my opinion. Also, one other thing I wanna do inside of here is I wanna add in a transition. And this transition is just gonna be 100 milliseconds, ease in and out. And this transition is for when we change our X and Y value, that's going to change our top and left. So we're gonna have a really smooth kind of animation, as you can see here, where you can see everything moving instead of it snapping into place. That's what this transition is going to allow us to do. So when we change X and Y, our top and left property are going to transition. So now let's just get rid of all these other values. We can go over into our JavaScript and start working on the meat and potatoes of this. So inside of here, essentially we have a few different components that we can take into account. Let me make sure I get rid of this tile here, is we have our game board, which is our grid. We have our cells inside that grid, and then we have the tiles inside of each individual cell. And we can almost think about that as like three separate classes. So the first class I kind of want to focus on is our grid. So we can create a file called grid.js, and all of our grid-related code we're going to put in here. We're just going to export this as a default class called grid just like that, and we can take in a constructor, and inside of the constructor, all I wanna do is pass in the actual grid element, just like that. So we're gonna get our grid element, and we're gonna do certain things with that grid element. Then inside of our script here, what I can do is I can say, hey, our game board is just going to be equal to document.getElementById of game board. That's our entire grid. I can say, hey, I wanna create a grid, which is a new instance of our grid class. As you can see, we're importing that up here. Just make sure it has the JS extension at the end we can pass it in the board that's associated with our grid. So that's all I wanna do for now with this. We just have a grid instance. Inside of our grid though, I kinda of wanna set up the creation of our grid. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna take our CSS variables and instead of defining them in CSS, I actually want to define them in JavaScript. So in our JavaScript file here, I wanna create a couple variables. So we're gonna create a variable for our grid size, our cell size, and our cell gap. So we're gonna say grid size is equal to four. We're gonna say that we have a cell size which is equal to 20. And we're going to come in here and we're gonna have a cell gap, which is equal to two. And the reason I'm creating these variables in our JavaScript instead of in our CSS is because we need access to our grid size in order to determine what cell is in what position inside of our grid. And same thing with like cell size and cell gap. So what I can do is I can take my grid element, I can take the style and I can call set property. And this allows me to set a property. For example, we could set our grid size variable. And we could set it to that grid size variable that we just created. So now this is setting that CSS variable for us. I'm gonna do this three more times, one for our cell size, and I'm gonna do it for our cell gap as well. And we can just say cell gap, and this one is cell size, and I just need to make sure that I use string interpolation to convert these to V min values. There we go. So right now, Essentially, all we've done is we've taken our CSS variables from CSS and put them into JavaScript. And when I save, you'll notice our grid is now back to normal. And that's because our JavaScript is setting these variables for us. And again, the reason I did that is so I can access our grid size inside of our JavaScript. And if I wanna change our grid to be like a three by three grid, for example, I can save and now we have a three by three grid instead of the four by four grid. Or I could say, hey, you know, now we have a five by five grid and boom, now we have a five by five grid. So it's really nice being able to easily change that inside of our JavaScript and all the rest of our code will work perfectly. 
And the next thing I want to do is I want to get all of the cells themselves. So I want to create some cell elements. So I'm going to create a function called create cell elements. I'm just going to pass it in our grid element. And this function is just going to create an individual element inside of here for each one of our cells. And that's because by default, I'm just going to have this game board be empty. And depending on the size of our grid, which we set right here, we're going to create the number of elements we need to fill our grid. So let's do that. Create cell elements, which takes in our grid element. Now inside of this function, we're just going to create an array, which is just going to be an empty array to start with. And then we're just going to do a simple loop. So we're going to start out when i is equal to zero. And then we're going to say when i is less than our grid size times itself, essentially our grid size squared, because we have a four by four grid, we're going to have 16 cells. So four times four. And then what I want to do is I just want to add one to i. So a simple for loop that's going to give us one loop through it for each one of our cells that we need to create. Then I want to create an individual cell, which is just going to be document dot create element. We just want to create a simple div and we want to give the class list here of cell to that cell. And then what we can do is take our cell array. And we can push that cell into it. So we can say cells dot push. So now this array is being added to. We can also take our grid element and we can append our cell itself to it. So we're adding the element to our page and we're adding it to this array, which we're going to return right here. So this create cell elements is going to create all of our cell elements and return to them to us. And when we save, you'll notice our grid is now populated. And that's because this grid element dot append is adding each cell we create into our grid. And you notice we don't have to put any of that in our JavaScript. And again, if we come in here and we change this value to like a three by three grid, you can now see our grid works perfectly with that three by three grid. And that's because everything is hooked up with these variables. So we have our grid class. The next thing we need is a cell class. So let's come in here and we're going to create a class called cell. And this cell class is going to have a constructor, which is going to take in our element. So we're just going to say cell element in X and a Y position. So we'll say this dot cell element equals cell element. And we say this dot X equals X and this dot Y equals Y. There we go. That is essentially our cell complete. And up here we can create a variable called cells. So we can say this dot cells is equal to and what we want to do is create a bunch of new cells. So we can take this array that's being returned, we can call map on it. So we're going to have each one of our cell elements. And for each one of our cell elements, I want to return a new cell object. And the cell object is going to take in our cell element. So right here we have our cell element. And then it's also going to take in an X and a Y. So to calculate our X and our Y, we need to do essentially a little bit of math that's going to involve our index. So we're going to need to get the index value here. To get the x position, what we can do is we can just take our index and we can just say modulo our grid size. This is going to give us our x position because if, for example, our index is the value 3, 3 modulo 4 is going to return 3. If our index here is, for example, 6, 6 modulo 4 is going to return 2. So it's going to tell us exactly where it is inside of our grid. Now to get the y value, it's very similar. We can just take our index and we can divide it by our grid size. This is going to give us like 1.2, for example, or like 1.5. If our index is 6 and our grid size is 4, this is going to return 1.5. What we want to do is we just want to get an integer. So we're just going to say math.floor, and that is going to give us the actual position of the y element inside of our cell. And what I can do here is I can just say console.log this.cells, and we can actually see this in action. If I inspect our page and we pull over our console, and I look inside of that, you can see we have an array of 16 elements, and you can see each one of these has x0, y0, x1, y1, and so on. And if I hover over the actual cell element, you can see on the right-hand side of my screen, x0, y0, that exact position is the one being highlighted. So we know that each cell is hooked up properly, which is what we want. Another thing that I'm going to do that's a little bit interesting is I'm going to use a private variable for our cells. So to use a private variable inside of JavaScript, what we need to do is put this little pound symbol in the front, and we also need to define that variable outside of our constructor. And this is saying, hey, we have a cells you know, variable here, and this cells variable is going to be set right here. So now we have a private variable that can only be accessed inside the grid class. It can't be accessed anywhere else. And the reason I'm doing this is because I cannot do console.log grid.cells anymore because this is a private variable. If I come over here, I'm going to get an error. As you can see, undefined. There's nothing being returned for grid.cells, and that's because it's a private variable. If I tried to access it like this, again, when I inspect my page, you're going to see that we're going to get an error. It's like, hey, private field must be declared in a closing class. Essentially, I cannot call this private variable. Now, the reason I'm doing that is just to make my code a little bit easier to work with. So instead of having this cells object directly accessible, instead, I'm only going to be able to access individual elements inside of it instead of all the cells at once.
This also makes it so I can't just overwrite all of the cells in my grid from outside the grid class, because that's something I wouldn't want to do. I can also do the exact same thing for our X and Y and cell element variables. So I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna make all these private. So this is gonna say cell element, this is gonna say X, and this is gonna say Y. Again, just so we can't modify those outside the cell class itself. So at this point, we've done a lot of work to essentially do absolutely nothing because we haven't changed anything from what we had in our CSS. But that's going to change now because now what I wanna do is actually start implementing, adding in the tiles to our grid. And to do that, we essentially need to get two tiles that we add to our grid because if we just refresh this over here, you'll see that every time we refresh, we get our two tiles in a random spot and they're either gonna have a value of two or a value of four. That's what I wanna do next. So what I can do is I can say, hey, grid.random empty cell. This is a function I'm going to create. And what I wanna do is I wanna set the tile of that to a new tile and that new tile is going to be on our game board. I wanna do that twice. So we have a lot of stuff we need to do in order to make this work. First, we need to create this random empty cell function. That's gonna be pretty straightforward, so let's do that next. Inside of our grid class, we're gonna create a random empty cell function. And this function is going to return to us whichever cell is empty, just a random one. So to make it easier to work with, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a getter, and this getter is gonna be a private getter to get all the empty cells. And then here, we're just gonna say return this.cells.filter, I wanna filter on the cells that don't have any tiles. So we can say cell.tile equals null. And this tile is going to be something that we're going to put inside of our cell. So our cell here, we're gonna have a private tile variable, so it's something we cannot change. And also, we're just gonna have a getter called tile that's going to return to us that private variable. And the reason that we're doing this as a private variable is again, so we can't just set our tile automatically from outside of our cell. If we wanna set it, we have to use a setter for that and we can put additional logic inside of there. Again, it's just gonna make this a little bit more robust. So now here essentially we're saying all of our empty cells are whatever cells that don't have a tile associated with them. That makes sense. Now what we wanna do is I wanna get a random index, sort of say random index. That is just going to be equal to math.floor of math.random where we're going to multiply it by the length of our empty cells. So what this is going to do is it's going to return us a value between zero and essentially our empty cells length and that's going to give us an index that is going to be a random value inside of our array. Then I can just take our empty cells and I can return the value at that random index. So every single time this is going to be a completely random value. Make sure I put the pound sign here so we can actually access that cell. There we go. So now we're going to be getting a random empty cell and we can set the tile of that to a new tile. For now, we don't actually have a new tile yet, but we can actually see this in action by if I just come in here, I say console.log grid.random empty cell. I'm just going to comment this code out. Now, if we just come over and we inspect our page go over to our console, so it looks like we have a missing parenthesis. There we go. Now, if we inspect our page and I come over to my console, you can see that we're getting a cell printed out. You know, it's got two and zero as its X and Y position. If we refresh our page, now we have another cell and this one has an X of one and a Y of two. Again, completely random. Every time we refresh our page, it's gonna be a different random cell. Same thing with every time we call this function, a different random cell. So now the next step is going to be obviously making it so that we can set our tile on our actual cell because right now we go over to our cell, you can see we don't have any way to set the tile. Let's create a setter to set our tile. This is gonna take in a value. The first thing I obviously want to do is I want to take our private tile variable. I want to set it equal to that value. And then if our value is equal to null, just return. Don't do anything else. So all I've said is, hey, get rid of the tile that we have set, essentially, if our value is null. Otherwise, if it is a real value, what I want to do is I want to take the x and y values on our tile and set them to the x and y position of our cell. So we're going to come in here, tile.y equals this dot y just like that. So in order to explain what's happening here, our tile has an X and Y position, which is where it is in the grid. For example, this tile is in the top left position. When we click the arrow key, we're moving our tile all the way over to the top right position. So what I'm doing is I'm taking my tile from one cell and I'm moving it into another cell. And when I move a tile from one cell to the other, I need to tell the tile, hey, you are moving from your old X position to this new X and Y position. That's essentially what this is doing. So let's move over to our tile class to figure out exactly how we're gonna hook all this up because essentially all we're gonna do when we set our X and Y is just change some CSS variables and then all the CSS we wrote, you know, with the transition here is gonna do all the magic for us to make it animate across the screen. Let me just save all these files real quick and we're gonna create a new file called tile.js. Inside of here, I'm gonna export a default class, which we're gonna call tile. 
And this default tile class has a constructor, which is going to take in our tile container. That's essentially our game board. And it's gonna take in optionally a value. And by default, this value is just going to be something between one and two. So we're gonna say 50% chance it's going to be two or it's going to be four. This math.random greater than 0.5, that's just saying half the time do one thing, half the time do the other thing. So half the time make the value four, half the time make it two. Now, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna take and create a tile element. So we can say this dot tile element. And if I come up here, I can say tile element so that we've defined that variable. I wanna create a new element. So we can say document.createElement, which is a div. Then I can take our tile element, I can take our class list, and I can add the tile class so all the CSS styling that we created will work. And also what I can do is I can say tile container, I want to append that tile element onto the end of that container. So we're just adding it into our game board. And then finally, we're going to set our value equal to our value right here that's getting passed in. So what we want to do is we want to be able to set our X and our Y position. So let's come down here, say set Y. And that's because inside of here, we're setting this X and Y position. Anytime we set a tile to a cell, we're giving it a specific X and Y position. So to do this, first we need to define that we have a hidden variable, a private variable for our X and Y. And we wanna say this dot X is equal to our value. Pretty straightforward, just like we did before. Same thing for our Y down here. We're gonna set it equal to our value. The next thing that I wanna do is I wanna take my tile element I want to take the style and I want to set that X CSS variable to our X value, just like this. We could do the same thing down here for Y, but I'm going to be setting Y to our CSS variable. So with this little simple code right here, all I've essentially done is I said, hey, you know what? Okay, we have our X, we have our Y. What I want to do is I want to set our X to whatever this value is. And the main thing is I want to set my CSS value, our CSS variable to this new X value. And this is what's actually going to position it in the correct location on our screen. So now if we inspect our page over here, let's see what errors we have to see what we've forgotten to implement. A tile is not defined. Okay, what we need to do is come into our script. And we just need to import tile from dot slash tile dot js. There we go. Now let's see what other errors we have. If we inspect, we go over to our console. It looks like we have no errors. So it's just printing out our cell, which is exactly what we want. And we can kind of get rid of that. But right now we have our tiles showing up on our screen. I just don't see them anywhere. They're in our HTML, I believe, because we go over here we scroll down, you can see we have our two tiles and they're in the correct location. They just aren't showing up on our screen for some reason. And it may be something to do with Z index. Let's set the Z index of this to like two. That didn't look like it made any changes. Oh, it's because we don't have a background color or a color properly. Because if I go into our styles, if you remember, we don't have a background color or a color set yet. We need to make sure we set that value. Now, when I created this background color and text color, I said that I want to change this based on the value of our tile. The best way to change something based on another value changing is to use getters and setters. So we're going to have a setter for our value. This is going to take in a V, which we'll call it. And up here, we're going to have a private value property. And what I want to do is I want to say, hey, I'm going to set our value. So we're going to set our private value to this V variable. And then what I want to do is I want to figure out how large this number is. So what we can do is we can say also, actually also, before we do that, we should take our tile element text content and set it to V as well. So now at least you can see we have our fours and if we refresh now we have a two and a four and a two and a two and so on. So at least the value is showing up where it should be. The next thing I wanna do is change the color. So I'm gonna do something called a math log. So I'm gonna say power is equal to math.log two. And this is gonna be V. What this is gonna do is essentially going to determine how many times has this number been raised to the power of two. So like two is just one, it's going to return here. Four is going to return two because it's two squared. If I put eight into here, it's going to return three because it's two cubed. So this is going to essentially give us the power of our number. So essentially every time we combine together a tile, this power number is going to increase by one. So what I can do is I can determine my background lightness based on that variable. So lightness here is just going to be equal to 100 minus my power times nine. Now, this isn't some fancy formula. Really, all I'm doing is saying, hey, as my power gets bigger, decrease my background lightness. Specifically, every time my power increases by one, decrease my lightness by 9%. There's no like hard and fast rule that I created this formula with. I just kind of played it around with it and figured out what looked good. Now, what we can do is we can take our tile element, take our style, and we can do our set property. And we want to set that background lightness property to our background lightness. 
and we want to make sure we convert this to a percentage. So let's come in here with some string interpolation. There we go. And essentially, I can do the exact same thing for our color, for our text. So we're going to have our text lightness here. And our text lightness is going to be a little interesting. I'm going to say if our background lightness is less than or equal to 50, then I want to use essentially a bright color. Otherwise, I want to use a dark color. So our lightness is either going to be a really bright or really dark. So when I save, you can now see that we have this showing up. And if our power was large, for example, I changed our power to like nine here, you can now see that our text color has swapped to be a light color instead of a dark color. So now you can see our four is a more blue color than our two because the lightness is essentially decreasing on it. And as our numbers grow and grow, they are going to get darker and darker, just like you can see over here. If we just combine together some of these numbers, you can see as they grow in size, for example, this 32 and 16 are a lot darker than the other colors around them. So now at this point, we've done a lot of work. We've written a lot of code and all we've done is rendered a few numbers on our screen. The next step is to finally start being able to move those numbers around, really give us a more enjoyable game to work with. So inside of our script, we need to handle user input. So in order to do this, first we're going to create a function called setup input. This is going to set up our input listener. So we can say window.addEventListener on key down. I want to call a function called handle input. We'll just create that down here, function handle input. And I want to make sure I only do this once. So we're going to say once true. This will only run the event listener once, and then it'll remove itself automatically. The reason I'm doing this is because if we come over here, when I click the down arrow key, I need to wait for all the tiles to move, for the new tile to pop in, and then I can accept user input again. Same thing when I click up, down, so on. I need to wait for the animation to finish playing. So what I'm going to do here inside of handle input is I'm going to move everything, wait for the animation to finish, and then we're going to have the actual input re-added again. So instead of handle input, I'm going to create a simple switch statement on our e.key. And this e.key is going to be one of a few things. In our case, we're going to have arrow up as one instance. And inside of here, what I want to do is I want to call a function called move up. And then I can just break out of here. I want to copy this down essentially a couple times. Because we're going to have arrow down, which is going to call move down. We're going to have arrow left and move left, and we're going to have arrow right, and move right. And then finally, we're going to have a default case here, and we'll just leave it empty for now. So these move functions are going to be what are handling moving all of our tiles. So let's just create those functions. Now we'll say move up, and that's the only one we're going to create for now. Now in my default case, what I want to do is I just want to call setup input again, and I want to return. And the reason for that is if we didn't click up, down, left, or right, that means we didn't click a key that did anything, so automatically we can wait for another user input by calling this and just exiting out of our function immediately. So now you can see if I just come in here and say console, whoops, console.log e.key, I come over here and I inspect our page, go to our console. If I click the A key, you can see it doesn't look like anything happening. That's because I didn't call setup input. There we go. Now we can actually inspect our page, go to our console, click A, you can see it's printing out A and so on, it prints out everything. And now if I click left, you can see it's trying to call move left, which doesn't exist. Same thing with if I clicked all the other buttons, they would call functions that don't exist. You also notice we're not setting up our input again. I need to make sure down here, I call setup input again. There we go. So now no matter what key we press, it's going to reset up our input. And we're also gonna have other things that happen down here. And that's why I have this return here, because if we don't click an arrow key, I don't want to run the other code that like adds in new tiles and does all the merging and all that other fun stuff. So now if you remember, I said that we're going to have a bunch of different files or functions for moving up, down, left, and right. And inside of here, all I want to do is I want to call a helper function, which we're going to call slide tiles. And this is going to take in all of the tiles that we want to slide by in like an actual grid. So it's going to be like a four by four array, because right now our cells inside of here, if we say grid.cells, and we actually make sure that we get all of our cells, this is going to be a 16 array, long array, and it's a one dimensional array. We want a two dimensional array that's going to be all of our columns and our rows. And in order to make things move up, the way we want to have our cells is we're gonna have our cells by column. We're taking all of our grid cells and we're gonna be orienting them by column instead of by row. And that's because we wanna be able to check things. When we slide our tiles, we wanna be able to check things down the column because we're moving things upwards the column. So we wanna be able to check, hey, in this particular cell, what's above it and what's above that and what's above that. So we wanna make sure we organize these by column. For example, if we were moving left or right, we would need to organize these by row instead. So what I wanna do is we just wanna do it by column. And inside of our grid class, we can create a simple function that's going to allow us to do that. We can say here, we're gonna have a getter that is just cells by column. 
And all this getter is going to do is take our normal cells and it's going to return to us a new array, which is going to organize them by a column. I'm going to take our cells. Oops, not the empty cells, all of our cells. I'm going to call the reduce function, which is going to take in our new cell grid variable, as well as the individual cell we're currently on. And by default, this is going to start out as an empty array. And all I want to do is I want to take our cell grid. I want to get the X position of our cell. And I want to set that either to our current cell grid of X or an empty array. So this is just essentially saying, hey, if there is no array already for this row, add an array. And then what I want to do is I want to take our cell grid. I want to get the cell.x. And I want to set that to our cell.y. And that is just our cell. So essentially what we've done here is we've created an array of array. Our first variable represents our row and our second element in that array represents our columns. So essentially our array, if we save this and just print this out, you can kind of see what we're talking about. I'll come all the way to the top here and I'll just say console.log grid.cells by column. Let's inspect this. And we go into our console, cannot read property undefined, reading undefined. Looks like we have an error right here. Let me just see. When I was trying to get our cell grid of cell.x, Oh, it's because I need to make sure inside of here, we return our cell grid. There we go. That should fix our error. Now let's inspect our page, go over our console, and you can see that this is obviously not quite what we're looking for. Now, the reason this isn't working is because our X and Y variables are private. We need to create getters to be able to access those X and Y variables. So we can say get X is going to return this dot X. I can do the exact same thing for y, and this should hopefully solve these issues. There we go. Now, if I inspect my page, now that we have getters for those, you can see we get a four by four array. And as you can see, all of our x zeros are going to be the first elements, and our y's are showing up in column-based order. Same thing with the next row in our grid, or in our array, is our next row in our grid. And you can see everything with x1, and then our y's are all in order. So essentially, we've created it so that it's really easy for us to go row by row and column by column to exactly sort through what's going on. So where x is equal to zero, that's this first column right here. Where x is equal to one, that's this second column right here. So each array inside this array represents one column of our grid. So when we're looping through this, we can say, okay, everything for this one column, we're going to do all the code for it, and then we move on to the next column. And I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about when we implement this function, if we scroll down here, called slide tiles. Let me just make sure we return the results of that. Slide tiles is going to take in our cells. So we can say cells here, and then inside of here, we just wanna loop through each one of our cells. So for each one of these cells we loop through, we're going to get a specific group. In our case, for moving up, this is going to be a column. We're going to be getting one single column. So this group is a column, but as we call this function with you know move left and move right, it might represent a row. But in our case, this is representing a column. Then what we want to do is we want to loop through that column and we want to loop through each of the rows in that column. So we're going to create a simple for loop. We can say for let i equal one and i is less than group dot length and then i plus plus. Pretty straightforward. We're just looping through this full group. Then what I want to do is I want to get the actual cell for our group at that index. So this is the particular cell we're working on. And then what I want to do here is another for loop. And this for loop is to loop through all the remaining tiles in this column. So we have our full column. And let's say that we're getting the very first element in our column, this very bottom one, because we're moving upward. What I want to do is I want to get this bottom element. And then what I want to do is I want to check all the elements above it. And I say, hey, can I move to the element above this? Can I move to the element above that? Can I move to the element above that? And so on. I want to constantly check if I can move upwards. And we're going to be starting at the top here. And this top one obviously can't move up, so that's fine. That's why we're starting with i equal one here, because this top thing can never move. So our very first iteration of this array, our first cell is going to be this one right here. And we're checking the cell above it to say, hey, can we move to this position? So to get only the cells above the one that we're currently at, we're going to say that our j variable here, which is just a random variable, doesn't matter what the name is, that's going to be equal to i minus one. That's going to give us essentially the cell directly above this one. So if we have i equal one, i equals zero is going to give us the cell directly above that one. Then what I wanna do is I wanna say when j is greater than or equal to zero, continue this loop, and then I wanna subtract one from j each time. So essentially, we're constantly moving upwards to see if we can move into that position. So we're gonna create our move to cell, which is our group of j. So at this point, on the first iteration, our cell right here is going to be this very first cell that's to the left of our four over here, and our move to cell is going to be the one directly above that. 
And what I want to do is I want to say, hey, can our cell right here move into this move to cell location? What we can say is, hey, if our move to cell can accept, which is a function we're going to create, and if it can accept the tile for the cell that we're currently trying to move, then what I want to do is I want to break. So if it cannot accept this, you know what, just completely exit out of this for loop because if it can't move up one tile, it's not going to move up even further as well. So for example, if we were checking all the way at the very bottom left hand corner, and we checked the tile directly above it, and it's like, nope, this can't move, there's no point in checking the other tiles because we already can't move past this one tile. So that's what this break is allowing us to do. It's just saying, hey, if we can't move, then we can't move. And what I want to do is I want to create a variable called last valid tile. By default, it's going to be null. And this last valid tile, I want to set to our move to cell. And this should say cell instead of tile, just so we have more better naming. So what this variable does right here is it's tracking what is the last cell that we were able to move to, because we're going to do this loop a bunch of times, essentially for all the cells we have above it. And as soon as we stop doing this loop, I'm saying, okay, you know what? The tile before that one, the cell before that one, this last valid cell is where we want to move our cell to. So if our last valid cell is not equal to null, then we want to move it. So what I can do is I can try to move this. So to move it, it's going to be a little bit complicated. So we have the ability to move into a location and we have an ability to merge tiles if they're the same number. So what we can do is we can say if our last valid cell dot tile is not equal to null. So that means if this currently has a tile, then what I want to do is I want to set the merge tile to be our cell dot tile. Otherwise, what I want to do is I want to take our last valid cell, I want to set the tile to our current tile. And then what I want to do finally is take our current tile and set it equal to null. So what this little bit of code here does is essentially all we're doing is we're saying, hey, are we even able to move this tile? If we are, run this code. And if we can, first I want to say, are we moving it into a location that already has a tile? So like in this game example, if I move to the right, these two fours and these two twos will combine together. As you can see, they combine together. So I'm saying, hey, does this location already have a tile at it? If so, then I want to set the merge tile. So we're essentially taking our merge tile and our current tile and merging them into one. So we're just storing the value of the tile we're merging with. So if that's the case, that's what we do. Otherwise, if this is an empty cell, for example, if we want to move this four to the left, you can see it just moves all the way to the left because there's empty cells next to it. I'm just saying, hey, if this thing doesn't already have a tile, just set the current tile to our tile and then take the cell that we're currently in and get rid of the tile that's in it. It no longer needs to be there. So this fancy code right here, all this is doing is just handling all of our movement. And this should actually work right now. All we need to do is implement this can accept function and deal with the merge tile and the tile. So if we come into here, what we want to do is we want to scroll all the way down to our cell. We have our getter for our tile. We have our setter. That's good. I also want to have a can accept function, and this is going to take in a tile. So if we can accept a tile, we're saying, okay, first of all, if we have no tile, then sure. So if the tile is equal to null, then obviously we can accept a tile. Otherwise, we want to say, hey, if our tile dot value is equal to the tile value that we're passing in, because you can only combine tiles with the same value, for example, these two 16s, I can combine it into a 32. So if the value of our current tile and the tile we're trying to accept is the same, then that's going to work. But there's one caveat, you see this eight right here, and we have two fours below it. When I push down, you can see that the two fours combine into an eight, but the two eights don't merge. That's because you can only merge one tile at a time. So if we already have a merge tile specified, we can't do another merge. So what we want to do here is have a check that just says, hey, if the merge tile is equal to null and then our tiles match. So what this little bit of code right here is saying is, first of all, if we have no tile, duh, we can accept the new tile. Otherwise, if we haven't already done a merge, so we don't already have a merge happening, and the tiles have the same value, then yes, you can also merge them together. And in order to use this merge tile, we're going to create a private variable called merge tile. And we're just going to create a getter and a setter for it. So we're going to say get merge tile is going to return merge tile, make sure that this is not private. And we're also going to need a setter. And our setter for our merge tile is going to be a little bit different. It's not just going to set. So first of all, obviously, we want to do a set. So we can say merge tile is equal to our value. Then we could say, hey, if our value equals null, then I want to return. Otherwise, I essentially want to do the same thing I did up here with setting my merge tiles position. So we can say our merge tile x and our merge tile y. 
The reason I'm doing this is again, just so our animations are going to work because we wanna make sure that the tile moves and it's going to look like they merge into one. Like if I come over here all right, to this example and I click down, you'll see that this eight will actually move downward. Oops, down, you can see the eight moved over top of the 16. Same thing if I move these fours to the right, they both move into that far right location and combine together. That's essentially what this little bit of code is doing. So let's actually test this out. We're just gonna click up real quick. It looks like that moved fine. We're gonna hit right. And it looks like it's not actually moving anymore no matter what I click. So let me just inspect to see what's going on here. If I go over to the console, you can see it says cannot read properties undefined reading value. In order to get around this issue, what we need to do is inside of our code, we wanna check, hey, is this cell that we're on, is the tile null? If the tile's null, don't do anything. We'll just say continue. So if we're trying to move a null tile, just ignore all of this code right here. So now if we push up, you can see all of our tiles move and hopefully that error is gone. As you can see, we no longer have an error. We have some console logs that we can get rid of. For example, this console log is no longer needed. And I believe we have a console log up here that is no longer needed as well. So now we have up working fine, but we can't move any other direction. I mean, we can only move up. So let's work on moving all the other directions. We'll say that we want to move left. We want to move down and we want to move right. So let's do move down right here because it's very similar to move up. And we're going to do move left and move right. And the nice thing about creating this helper function is all these other move up, move down, move left functions, they're all really straightforward. So for move down, all we're going to do is get our cells by column, but we want to reverse the order of them. What I mean is I'm going to take this, I want to map through this. So this is going to give us each column. So for each column, what I want to do is I want to just reverse our column. So I can say column dot reverse, just like that. And the reason I'm putting this and spreading it out into brand new arrays, because when you call reverse, it actually changes the actual underlying array. And we don't want to change the underlying array stated in our grid. We just want to modify this one instance of this. So now if I save this, if I move up, it works. When I move down, it works. So move up and move down are both working like we expect. And the reason I'm flipping this is because I want to go through our columns in reverse order to move downward because I want to check from the bottom here essentially and go up while with move up, I'm checking from the top and moving down. That's the only reason I reverse this here for move left. What I want to do is I want to get our cells by row and I want to do the exact same down here for move right. And I just want to map through essentially our row and I want to reverse our row because this cells by row is going to be the same as cells by column but it's going to give it to us in row format instead of column format. So we can copy this because it's going to be an almost identical function. All I need to do inside of here is just kind of swap the position of where our X's and our Y's are going to go because instead of being by column, I want this to be by row and make sure that we call that by row just like that. So now if I move left, they move and you can even see our fours combined together. Down works, right works, up works, left works, that all works fine. Now the reason this four is showing up still here in the top left corner is because we're not handling what happens when two tiles merge together. This tile just no longer exists. It's not attached to anything. It's saved as the merge tile, but we want to make sure we get rid of these merge tiles and combine them together into larger tiles whenever we do a movement. So if we go back into our handling of movement function, we'll just scroll up to here. This is where our other code is coming in. What I want to do is I want to take our grid cells and for each one of our cells, I want to merge them. So I'll say cell.merge tiles, just like that. And we can create a simple function for that. We can come down here. We can say merge tiles. Now, first we want to see, is this even something that has a tile we can merge? So if this dot tile equals null or this dot merge tile equals null, well, just return. That means we can't do any merging because we need to have both a merge tile and an actual tile. Otherwise, if this case works, what we can do is we can take our tile dot value and all I'm going to do is take the value of our tile and our merge tile and add them together. And what this is going to do is essentially double the value of our tile. Then I want to take our merge tile and I want to remove it. So we're going to create a function called remove to get rid of it. And I want to get rid of it also inside of here. So I'm going to set this to null. So I'm going to remove the tile from the DOM and I'm also going to set the merge tile on the cell to null. So in our tile, let's create the remove function. This is super straightforward. What we can do is we can just say this dot tile element dot remove. This is going to get rid of it from the DOM. So now let's just say that we get two tiles with the same number. So let me just refresh till that happens. Getting really unlucky. Here we go. So we have our twos. If I move up and then move to the right, doesn't look like it's actually working. Looks like we have an error. Let me inspect our page. It says cannot read properties undefined reading for each. 
Oh, and that's because we don't have access to our cells. They're a private variable. We need to just create a getter for that. So if we scroll up, we can just say get cells return this dot cells just like that. So now move up and move to the right. You can see they combine together and we got NAN. So clearly we have a little bit of an issue going on. Let's move down here, tile that value, merge tile that value. Are we exposing our value? We are not. So let's create a getter for value. And this is just going to return this dot value. There we go. So now let's make sure we get the same number, move down, move to the right. You can see they've combined together into the tile eight. We just refresh and do that again. You can see they combined into that tile. You'll notice the animation is not quite working properly though. The reason for this is because if we go into our script here, we're calling slide tiles and slide tiles is doing all of our movement. And then behind this scene, there's some animation occurring on the CSS side of things, but we're not waiting for that animation to finish before we do this merging of our tiles. We need to essentially await calling these move up, move down and move left functions. So we're gonna call await on all of these, make this async. So we're gonna wait for all of our movement to finish before we call this merging of our tiles. And to make this work, we essentially need to return some promises from slide tiles. I'm gonna change this to say return promise.all. This is going to return to us an array of promises. So I'm gonna wrap everything in that promise all. And then here, instead of doing a for each here, what I wanna do is I wanna say flat map. Flat map is just going to be just like normal map, but it's going to flatten out the result into a one dimensional array instead of multi-dimensional and that'll work perfectly for us. So what we can do inside of here is we can create a new promise. So we can just say const, whoops, we're not a new promise, just an array of promises. So we can say promises is equal to an array here. And then all the way down at the bottom, when we have our cell tile doing all of its movement and stuff, what we wanna do is return our promises. So first we're creating this array and then we're returning it down here and we wanna to add to this promise here. So we say promises.push and this is because every time that we have a tile that can move, we wanna add a new promise here that says, hey, wait for the animation to finish. So we can say cell.tile.wait for transition. There we go. And that's gonna be a function we create. And this function is going to return to us a promise, which is going to resolve as soon as our animation finishes playing. So what this is essentially doing right here is it's saying, okay, loop through everything, return to us some promises, which we're returning down here. And I wanna to add to that promise array every single time that we have a new animation. So now in our tile, let's create that function. Wait for transition. This function is going to return to us a new promise, which is going to resolve just whoops, just like that. And we're just gonna say this dot tile element dot add event listener. You can add an event listener on transition end. And this is going to call our resolve function. We just wanna do this one time. So we'll say once is true. So now whenever our animation finishes, then it's going to let us continue with the rest of our code. So if I hit right, you can see our animation completes. And then as soon as it's done, our tile then changes to the tile of four. That's really good. And the reason that this is working is because every time we have a movement, we're saving that animation in our promises. And then up here, we're just waiting for all these promises to finish before we do the merging of our tiles. Now, the next thing that I wanna do is I wanna add a new cell to the board because every time you make a movement, a new cell is created. So I'll say const new tile is equal to new tile. And it's gonna be a tile that's inside of our game board. And then what I wanna do is I just wanna say, hey, give me a random empty cell. I wanna set this tile to that new tile, just like that. So now every movement I make, a new tile is being added to the board. So already the game is starting to come along. You can see it's pretty much complete at this point, but there's a few minor things that we need to do, such as what happens if I click left when I can't move left? Or let's say I move up and I can't move left. In this case, I cannot move up. When I click up, you can see it's still creating new tiles, even though there's actually no movement occurring. So we need to make sure you can only move in a direction that you are allowed to move. That's pretty easy to do. We can create a function that just says, hey, if we can move up, and I'm gonna say, if we cannot move up, then what I wanna do is I wanna set up our input again, and I want to return. I wanna do this a bunch of times. So before each one of our movements, I wanna check, is this movement possible? If so, then do it. So can we move down? Can we move left? And then finally, can we move right? And let's just create these functions. We'll kind of minimize all this other code down since it's already done. We don't need to worry about it. So we can create a like can move up function, for example. And inside of here, we're just gonna you know return 
a can move function. And this can move function is gonna work just like with our slide tiles. We're gonna pass it our grid cells in the orientation we want. So we're gonna say cells by column. And what I can do is I can create that can move function, which takes in all of our cells. And I can say, hey, return cells.sum of our group. In our case, this is going to be a column. And then I wanna do another return of our group.sum. And this is gonna take in our cell and it's gonna take in an index. So inside of here, I just wanna check, is it possible to move any of the cells at all? So this is pretty easy to do. If our index here is equal to zero, then return false, because we cannot move a cell, like we can't move the top cell upwards, it's impossible. So we're gonna immediately return false. Then we're gonna say, hey, if our cell dot tile equals null, so if there's no tile at all, also return false, because we can't move an empty cell, just, that's just not how it works, you can only move the cells that exist. Then we're gonna get our move to cell, move to cell, which is just gonna be our group of our index minus one. We're just checking the cell directly above the current cell. And we wanna return move to cell dot can accept our cell dot tile. So all we're doing here is we're saying, okay, if this is the top cell, obviously return false. If the cell is empty, obviously return false. If none of those cases are true, then what we wanna do is we wanna check the cell directly above it. And if the cell directly above can accept the cell that we are currently in return true. And if at any point, any of the cells at all in this cells array return true, the entire thing is going to return true for us. So this is how can move up is going to work. So if I click up, you can see it moved up. Click up, it moved up again. But now when I click up, you notice it's not moving up, but I can move other directions. Actually, it doesn't let me move other directions, so we must have an error. Can move down is not defined. Okay, that's fine, because I haven't created that function. But you'll notice when I click up, it's not creating new tiles and all that other stuff like it was doing before. It's checking, saying, hey, we cannot move up, so we're gonna reset up our input and just return. So let's implement this for can move down, left and right. So we're gonna have can move down, left, right. And in the can move down, again, we're just gonna do that map. So we're gonna say map over our column. And we're just going to reverse our column. There we go. I'm gonna do the exact same thing down here for moving to the right, but this is for a row instead of a column. And this is going to be cells by row. There we go. So now this should hopefully check for moving up, down, left, and right. So for example, if I click left, nothing happens. I can't move left. While if I click right, when I find an instance where I can't move right, here we go. This does not let me move right. I click right. It doesn't do anything. So all of our movement is being checked correctly. So we're handling can move. We're handling movement. Now really the only thing left to do is handle the loose state. So what I want to do here is I want to have a simple check that just says, hey, if we cannot move up or, or I'm sorry, and we cannot move down and we cannot move left because we just want to check all of our directions and we cannot move right. So if we can't move in any direction, we've lost. So what I want to do is I want to say, hey, take our new tile. I want to wait for our transition. I'm going to pass in true here. And that's because in this function, I'm gonna determine, is this an animation? I'm gonna set this to false. By default, it's not an animation. So we're gonna say, if it's an animation, then here we're gonna say animation end instead of transition end, otherwise transition end. So what this code does is there's a different event to listen to for animations versus transitions. And in our styles, you can see our animation is what we use when the tile appears, while a transition is what we use when the tile moves side to side or up and down. So that's why we're checking for an animation here, which is where we're passing in true. When that animation of the tile finishes appearing, what I wanna do is I just wanna have a simple alert that says, you lose, pretty straightforward. And then here, I just wanna have a simple else, which is where we're gonna put up our setup input. And instead of an else, let's just do a return here, and then we can get rid of that. There we go, that does the exact same thing. So I'm just making sure we don't add our input again. Even though if we added our input, it wouldn't matter because all of these are going to make sure we can move before we allow the movement. Now I did just notice I need to make this a can move right, a cannot move right. So now, once we've done that, if we just move this around a bunch, eventually we're gonna to get to the point where we can no longer move our tiles in any direction. So just kind of moving around spastically, hoping that we lose here. If it takes too long, I'll speed this up for you. But it looks like we're about to lose. There we go. Right when we lost, you can see it waited for the animation of the tile to appear, and then we got a modal that says you lose.
And that's all it takes to create this 204080 clone. Again, if you enjoyed this video, I highly recommend you check out the fully polished version at 204080daily.com. It's going to be linked down in the description below. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.